Hi everyone, welcome to Draftscapes, I'm Chris Tuccio. In this episode, I'm gonna show you how to create consistent and attractive architectural lettering for your landscape design plans. Stick around. Hi everyone, so in today's lesson we're going to focus on architectural lettering. Now this is the type of letters that you might see on a title block or for plant labels or notes on your landscape design plan and it's a very valuable skill to learn when you're doing hand drafted plans. Uh, when you're providing a client a beautiful hand drafted plans with beautiful architectural lettering it really says a lot about the craftsmanship that you're putting in and the amount of time that you're dedicating to their specific work or their project and typically this was done quite a lot in architecture architecture and landscape design firms where you had multiple designers working on one project, you could have a consistent series of labels where it didn't look like a hodgepodge of designers working on one project. Now, the rules for this have become somewhat lax because we have the rise of the digital uh, software programs like AutoCAD uh, and some of the others that kind of do this for us. And so it's kind of a lost art, but we still want to be uh, sort of true to how it's actually done. Now, we do have some flexibility here, but there are certain types of tools that we need to look over and review in order to do this. So what we're going to do is we're going to get our drafting board, some paper, a pencil, and our AIMS lettering guide, and we're going to start drafting. Okay, so we're going to start with the basics. I'm set up here with my drafting board and a parallel rule, um, but this can easily be substituted with a T-square if you don't have the, uh, the parallel rule attachment to your drafting board. Um, I'm on a piece of, of uh, bond drafting paper and I have my uh, lead holder, uh, two millimeters with 2B graphite um, uh, sharpener here and then uh, the Ames lettering guide. Um, and I may reach for a triangle uh, when we do some vertical lines. Um, as usual, you know, I'm just gonna uh, throw everything that I'm using in, in the description in case you wanna pick up uh, these tools. So I should note that I'm using uh, 2B graphite, so it's a, a darker line, uh, so you can see it when it shows up on the video, um, but that's not necessary. I would actually advise uh, choosing uh, something a little lighter, maybe an HB or H, something harder. Um, also for smaller lettering applications, uh, when you want very fine detail, uh, don't use the two millimeter uh, like I'm using the lead holder. Uh, reach for a five, uh, sorry, a, a 0.5 millimeter mechanical pencil. That's gonna provide a much finer line, uh, but it also might be a little bit more technically difficult. Um, so just be aware of that. Uh, now, the first thing we need to do is set up our guidelines. So uh, that's the primary purpose of this uh, tool, which is the Ames Lettering Guide. Um, I'm gonna throw up a, a picture of the Ames Lettering Guide and walk you through really how it operates. So the Lettering Guide has two parts to it, a base that remains stationary and rests against the parallel rule, and a rotating disc that is used to draw the guidelines. You can rotate the disc by simply holding the base with one hand and rotating with the other. On the bottom of the rotating disc, you're going to see the numbers 2 through 10. Across from these numbers on the base is a little raised tick mark which is used to designate the number or metric you're going to use. We're going to get back to what these numbers mean in a bit, but right now let's focus on all the different columns of holes and what they mean. These holes all the way on the left are fixed at a spacing of 1 8 inch increments. Since it's a very common spacing, if you want to use only guideline space 1 8 inch apart, you can simply use these and not need to calibrate the disc in any other way. The next fairly easy column to understand is the column second from the right. Similar to the previous column, these are evenly spaced holes, but can be calibrated along with the numbers on the bottom part of the disc to obtain a desired guide spacing. So for the numbers on the bottom, each number, 2 through 10, indicates 1 32nd of an inch. When you line up the number with the tick mark, that indicates the height of the letters you're going to be writing. So, if I set the guide to 4, that would indicate 4 32nds of an inch, or 1 8th inch in height. If I wanted to write in 1 quarter inch height, I would need to have the setting of 8, because 8 32nds of an inch equals 1 quarter of an inch. It doesn't really take long to get the hang of the fractions, but if it really confuses you, just take time, make a cheat sheet, keep it handy so you know what setting you need to designate for what desired spacing. 
Once you get the hang of that, the next set of holes are very similar. You have two columns of holes, one column to the right designated with a 3 slash 5, and the other on the left designated by a 2 slash 3. You'll notice that the holes are in groups of three, with the top and bottom holes connecting with an arcing connecting line. These two holes work exactly the same way as before. If we want quarter inch spacing, we'll simply set to eight, and then we'll utilize the top and bottom holes. The reason the two-thirds or three-fifths designations are there is because of the middle holes. The purpose of the middle holes, both on the side columns and the middle column, is to assist in writing out either lowercase letters or letters with smaller elements within them, for example, R, B, or P. If you draw out the line using the middle hole in the two-third column, the middle line will be two-thirds of the way up between the guides. The same is true for the three-fifths column, creating a middle line that is three-fifths of the way between the guides. And the middle guide, the middle holes, are exactly halfway in between. You can then use these middle guidelines to assist you in sizing those smaller components of letters uniformly. Finally, we have the last set of lines, which is the metric. The metric holes are specifically for designers to use if they want 3.08, 6.1, or 9.7 millimeters in height. They're not commonly used in the US and we won't be spending time on them today. Okay, so we're gonna be using the one quarter inch uh, uh, spacing for our guidelines. It's a very common larger spacing. Typically most labels are gonna be made with eighth inch or quarter inch spacing because uh, they provide the best size of readability for both up close and from a distance. You could go smaller, say to 3 seconds of an inch, uh, but I really wouldn't advise labeling anything smaller than that. So uh, we're set up here. Our AIMS lettering guide is set to the number eight, eight meaning eight thirty seconds of an inch, which equals quarter inch. It's resting nicely on our parallel rule or T-square. And uh, I'm simply going to uh, place my uh, pencil, uh, my uh, graphite into uh, one of the holes and then drag my line. Now I'm using uh, the holes all the way at the end. So I'm gonna be using uh, the uh, 3 slash 5, uh, you can use the 2 slash 3, it doesn't matter. Uh, I'm going to be using those and I'm going to simply uh, start uh, by placing my pencil in the top hole uh, where the arc starts. Um, so right here and I'm just going to be starting from uh, the opposite side of my body. So I'm lefty, so I'm going to start from the right and move uh, to the left. If you're righty, you're going to start from the left and move to the right across your body. Okay, and we're just going to pull the line there, move back. Now I'm just following the arc. Uh, for, for this tutorial, we're not going to worry about the middle line, so I'm going to simply follow the arc down to the bottom line, okay, and do the same thing. And that's one guide now. That's one line, the top of the line and the bottom line that's made. I'm going to do that two more times so that we have three nice sets of guides, okay. That's the top of number two. Follow the arc down to the bottom. That's the bottom of the second line. Now we're gonna do the third line. Top of the third line. Follow the arc down to the bottom line. And there we have it. So now we have uh, three lines that's one, that's two, that's three. Three guides uh, that are available uh, for us to utilize. Now again, I'm using a graphite so that it shows up really nicely and thick here. Um, I'm using 2B, which is a very soft graphite. Uh, it should be noted that they also make blue photo pencils that can be used in lieu of the standard graphite guidelines. The beauty of these is uh, the blue guidelines actually won't show up when the paper is photographed or scanned. Um, and so, you know, just because of the visibility of the vi video, I'm using the graphite, but I'm going to link uh, in the description uh, the blue pencils because I, I do think they're worth checking out. So I'm going to move the camera a little lower and we're going to see actually how we can then uh, letter uh, properly. Okay, so now that the guides are created, we're going to start adding our letters. Now, there are a few rules to consider when you're drafting architectural letters. Uh, first, uh, you want all vertical lines uh, to be as, as perfectly vertical as possible. So, like the bottom part of a T or uh, the side part of an F. 
uh, they should be as straight as you can, straight up and down. And that's why sometimes you might reach for a triangle for that purpose and just rest it against your parallel rule or T-square. Uh, the second is we want horizontal lines uh, to be slightly thicker if possible, but have, most importantly, have a, a slightly upward slant. Um, the slant should be consistent with each letter uh, throughout the document and in each word throughout the document. So, for example, um, if I was to write the letter he, or, um, sorry, the word he, or uh, the letter e, okay, I would want each individual uh, horizontal line to be parallel with each other with a slight upward slant. And this, the actual degree of the slant doesn't matter. Uh, the consistency is what matters most. So this would be correct, uh, but if I drew it uh, or I wrote the letter E kind of like uh, this, uh, that would be incorrect. I have one uh, sort of upward slanting, one downward slanting, one uh, perpendicular. That, that would be incorrect. We want them all to have a slight upward slant and be consistent. And then finally, for letters that have um, just natural slants to them or that are rounded, uh, such as uh, the letter P, let's say. Uh, we would want that upper portion to be slanted slightly upward and again, uh, sort of segmented and, and parallel uh, with it, it itself. Okay, so that makes uh, so these rules uh, kind of, uh, of, of guidelines, if anything, because there is some flourishing uh, that would be uh, done. You know, you have a personal style. And you want to make sure, if at all possible, to try and kind of draw with your arm, not necessarily your wrist, but uh, do whatever feels comfortable. Don't try and stress or uh, get very tense when you're doing it. Now, with that being said, uh, let's practice some words. Now, uh, relaxing uh, helps, and, and a lot of times people might practice sort of like the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog or some sort of weird phrase like that because it has all the, the letters of the alphabet. I'm not really a fan of that. I think it's, it's better if we go practicing some common uh, words that we might find in uh, a regular uh, landscape situation. Uh, so, uh, for example, uh, practicing uh, the letter or the word tree. So you see all the verticals uh, for the word tree are perfectly vertical and all the horizontals have a slightly upward slant and they're all consistently parallel. So uh, the word tree is a nice one uh, to use because it has uh, one, two, three, four verticals and several horizontal slants and something you would consistently use in your landscape design. Another one uh, that's commonly used is lawn. Uh, this one, uh, verticals, uh, again, you also have uh, some kind of slants uh, and connectors. Uh, I do my N uh, this way, a little more ordinary, uh, but a lot of designers will do an N kind of like this, uh, which is perfectly acceptable. Same thing with like an M. Uh, they might have an M with a very shallow uh, interior, perfectly acceptable, that, that's fine. Um, as I stated uh, earlier in the video, due to the rise of AutoCAD and other computer programs, the reliance on very precise lettering, uh, as it once was, uh, isn't there anymore. Um, so, you know, there, there's no longer that reliance on making sure that yours is exactly the same as a colleague's. So, this allows for a bit of flexibility and flourishment with your letters. So, uh, you know, over the years, I actually developed uh, for my style a letter G that has this little beard to it. I particularly like uh, doing uh, letters like that. Um, so you'll find that you fall into the same kind of, of, of guide. Um, so again, uh, let's, let's practice uh, some, some words. So another word uh, that you might commonly find is patio. Um, so uh, you can do uh, the word patio uh, like that. Um, the word deck. Um, another word that's commonly used is property. So uh, it's a longer word, uh, but you kind of get used to uh, doing several uh, letters in a row and you might use it for property line or um, uh, areas in which you might need the, the, uh, an address uh, for a, a client's uh, particular uh, use or for their particular plan. You might use the word property. Uh, another one might be slope. So 
you have tree, lawn, patio, deck, property, slope. Those are nice six words to practice. You get a good amount of, of variation within them. Um, so, you know, practice them a few times. You may get the hang of, of doing proper lettering. So we're going to do it one more time together. I'll uh, do, see how many I could fit. We'll start with tree. And you can see even there's, there's some variability even with mine sometimes. Uh, tree. Lawn. Patio. Deck. And I think I'm just going to be able to fit property here. I could squeeze in in property. Okay, so with that, uh, you have a good uh, idea of how to do architectural lettering. Uh, you have an, uh, a good understanding of how you can make it look uh, very natural, yet within uh, some guides of, of what is considered architectural lettering. And really here, I, I just want to uh, say as, as you're doing this and as you're practicing, it really is practice that's the important part. Um, you know, uh, to become proficient in it, um, you know, I would say, uh, you know, take notes uh, in, in this kind of lettering, do all of your handwriting in this type of lettering. Um, you know, that's how I got much better at it. Every time I addressed an envelope, signed my name, wrote anything by hand for, you know, six months, I remember when I was starting, it was done in architectural lettering. So, you know, I would consider uh, consistently doing this and uh, over the course of, of several months, you'll get much better at it and it'll feel much more natural. So uh, there you have it, uh, the basics of lettering uh, to get you started. If you like the content of the video and you want to learn more information about landscape design or the landscape profession, uh, be sure to subscribe to the channel uh, and also head over to draftscapes.com uh, where you're going to find not only similar content, but also a wide variety of other helpful articles and resources. So. I'll see you at the next video.